Now we chose to go to a small town in, in a very undeveloped area. But that was our choice. We didn't want to go to a city and then build around the city. We wanted to go to a little country place and build around that country place. And so that's what we did. He's just a regular old person. There's nothing outstanding or about either one of us. We're two bus kids saved by God's grace. I do remember, like when I was in sixth grade, uh, everybody had to write a book report on, on what you want to be when you grow up. And I, and I wrote on minister only because nobody else chose it. We met in high school. And we dated our senior year, and we got married when we graduated from high school. And how we got started in mission was, both of us pretty much were raised in families that did not attend church. And we had someone that would pick us up and take us to church. Randy and Phyllis, when they started, they came from not Christian families. They didn't come from pastors' homes or, or evangelists' homes. Uh, their families were unsaved. Uh, Randy was saved at the age of 12. Phyllis was saved at the age of nine. And both of them, uh, started going to the church as a result of, of someone coming, knocking on their door, and inviting them to come to their church. After we were married, these crazy missionaries kept coming to our church and presenting the need, the need, the need. And every time I knew a missionary was coming, I'd try to stay home because it, I knew it was getting out of control with my husband. One, one day, this pastor from Peru, missionary from Peru came and preached, and I knew I was in trouble because after service, my husband went down and surrendered to be a missionary, and I started crying, and they said I was excited, but I wasn't. I was crying because I didn't like the missionary, and I didn't like my husband, and I didn't like anybody at that particular time. And so that's how our mission road got started, and then we ended up going to Bible school from there with me complaining, complaining, because I was not born into a Christian family. I was not raised into a Christian family. So therefore, I didn't feel like God could use us in ministry. I, I, I didn't know why he would call my husband into ministry. When did either one of us was raised in Christian homes? At that time, my spiritual walk with the Lord was about a two month old. Not too much more than that. I think sometimes we look at Kenya, it's a little disappointing because it has so much potential. Randy was challenged to come here to Kenya. He was challenged that he would come and spend his life working to proclaim the gospel message to help get the gospel to the world. And, 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 and Randy came. Uh, he came to Kenya. He came to this city. And he began to work. And, and then, as he says, you know, 40 years just, just flew by. And as a result of that, God has, has started hundreds of churches. There have been thousands, tens of thousands that have been saved. Um, and God has just done an amazing, amazing work here in Western Kenya through the lives of a couple of bus kids. After we graduated, we went to Gainesville, Texas to work in a church and him as, as a youth pastor. And so um, the pastor there, his name was Richard Lewis, he went to Kenya as a missionary. And then he kept writing Randy and saying, you, you need to come to Kenya, come to Kenya. The work is so amazing here. Uh, the things that are going on, I need you to come here and help me. And that's where his roots started. Before that, we had, he had always wanted to go to Bolivia as a missionary. And so that's where the connection to Kenya came from. When we first got to Kenya, the churches didn't believe that kids knew how to be saved. They didn't know that kids could understand the gospel. And there were no Sunday schools everywhere we went. Kids ran and played outside during church. It, to me, that was just, why? I mean, we would go into these teaching centers where there'd be like five or six churches, and every one of the kids, the parents would come, the kids would come, they'd play outside. 
And I think, this is wrong. So I would pick up all the kids from all those churches and just go and put them in a corner somewhere and have Sunday school with them. And that's where I got started loving little kids. Well, I, I always love little kids, but they're so receptive and so sweet. You can put a hundred little kids in one room all by myself with them and they would listen and respond. It's just amazing. You know, he went in with, to the Kenyans and, uh, and he had said, you teach me to be a good missionary. And that's what he even tells Josh and Sean right now. You let these people teach you how to be a good missionary. You think that you're here to teach them, but really, you let them teach you. So he learned most of what he, his beginning foundation came from them, them teaching him. That's how you learn culture. That's how you learn who those people are. That's how you learn what their heart is. And so that was one thing that he has always done, is learn from them. Not saying, I'm the big missionary, you all need to bow down to me because I came from America and I have all the funds. No, he didn't do that. And his goal from the very beginning was to make leadership, to train leadership. And so he would study, study, and study, and started the Bible Institute in our garage. From the very beginning, that's what he wanted to do. And so leadership. He's saying, I can lead one church, but if I train 20 men, then that's 20 churches being led. And so I don't even remember when he didn't have that goal. Randy, uh, he used to say how he would drive through village after village after village, and he would keep looking down these different dirt roads when they first got here. And he thought, where does that dirt road go? I wonder what village, I wonder what people there are that live at the end of this road that have not heard the gospel. And that was something that he said really compelled him and drove him to take the gospel and to continue just going to the next village and the next village and the next village, training more men, more pastors to go to these villages that he knew he couldn't reach on his own. When we went there, they had no study material. They, you know, they just had the Bible, which is fine, but to add to and grow and keep studying, keep studying. He is someone who studies the God's Word and anything he can get his hands on all the time because he says to me, my men will never be more spiritually than what I am. If I don't grow, how can I teach them? So he's always growing. He's always looking for new material. He's always adding to. He's, he doesn't want the pastors to become stale in their studies. So that's why if you go into our office, you're going to see thousands of study books because that's what, that's his passion. You are in the room filled with all of the work this man did over all these years. Uh, not the work in the men's lives, but the work that he prepared to give them. Hours of study, hours of preparing material, trying to get things from English into Swahili and to help train men. There are books all across here and every one of these boxes is a different course. Here's a course on a third year church history. Here's prophecy for third year. What Brother Randy did was say, man, I've got to help these people. I know that if I equip them and empower them, they can do it all too. There's a man named Gagula who Randy trained as a young man, just a, a young guy um, growing up, spending much time with Randy, Randy teaching him, training him. He went to Uganda. He started a church now today. There's almost 20 churches in Uganda. There's a Bible school in Uganda, and, and, and that church, those pastors have greatly impacted eastern Uganda and that area. But as Randy says, you know, we've just barely scratched the surface. Always his life has been training leadership and putting them in a place of leadership, even, even though they, sometimes they would fail. But he's saying that's the way it has to be, you know, for them to grow, for them to take responsibility. And then they get accountable to each other, which is helps. And so I know that, I don't know if you know, but our churches are all in fellowships. So it's the Nandy Fellowship or the Eldoret Fellowship. And, and those men work together as a group to help encourage the younger pastors and start churches. And those, that's been his whole life. Uh, not him telling everybody what to do, but letting the Holy Spirit lead them as well. Bringing them to a place spiritually where they were strong enough to be good pastors. We've got some great men. The book of Acts chapter 14. And Paul kind of gives us a list of things that, that he was doing at that particular time as he emphasized then his his ministry. But the great thing 
as Paul said at the end, that, and he gave them over to the Lord. And I got thinking about that. How does Paul give them over to the Lord? And to me, then it became that empowerment. They were in charge. If I've asked somebody to do something, I've, I've never taken it back from him, no matter how badly he did it. Now, if he quit and left, I pick it up and we go on with it. I met a missionary Randy back in 1980. So I've been with him for more than uh, 40 years and he has been a blessing to my life, uh, my family, and also the ministry. Uh, when he came, uh, we had no Bible school, so we started, he started uh, Bible school back in 19, uh, 1980, and uh, through that Bible school, of our 500 uh, men and women have graduated from the Bible school, and because of the work that uh, the Bible school has been doing, we have uh, started over 300. We have started over 300 uh, churches. Uh, we have churches uh, here in Kenya, and also we have churches in uh, Uganda, and also we have uh, churches uh, uh, in in Sudan, and some few churches also in Tanzania. Randall Stewart has believed in the training. He has believed uh, throughout the independence of the local church. He's a missionary who has not been interfering with the pastors and the independence of the local church. He has left the duty of the church to the pastors and him has just remained to give advisory role and supporting training, especially the issue of theology and other matters. According to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible says the Apostle Paul told the Timothy to continue in the things that he had learned, knowing from whom he had learned, and therefore, I want to say that uh, Mission Arendo has been my mentor uh, because his life is, uh, was a, a, an example to me. He has been my father, he has been my teacher. I can't forget his work on teaching because after Bible school, he introduced the Bible uh, uh, study books, uh, which had uh, a great implication upon my life. Uh, it strengthened me spiritually as a pastor. I want to thank God for his ministry in Kenya, not only in my life, uh, but also in the other areas of ministry. He has planted many churches. We have for around 400 churches in Kenya. We enjoy serving together with other pastors in the fellowships that he's been uh, encouraging to grow. I serve with the Lord Bible Baptist Fellowship and I'm very glad that he has established me as a, a, a preacher. Narendi is more of a teacher than a missionary. The reason is that uh, he has been working out many things, fitting books, making sure that pastors are well equipped and always he was more of a teacher to us, uh, especially to myself, than uh, a missionary. I can say he is the uh, he is the missionary here in Kenya that that has planted more ch more churches than any other missionary. Uh, chapter fourteen of Acts it says, and when they preached in that village and then taught many. So it began with evangelism. There has to be evangelism there. And Randy, his, his, his prayer, his desire was that he could live, that he could keep living a long life here in Kenya, that he could share the gospel, that he could keep training men. And he said, I know I can't do it all. I, I need other guys, I need more people. And so his prayer, his heart, his desire is that there would be more men, that there would be more uh, women, people who would come, people who would come to a place like Eldoret and spend their lives. Randy said time and again, he said, you just, you just have to come. You just need to come and be here. Spend your life doing something for the, for the glory of God, for the proclamation of the gospel. Make an impact 
on this wicked world, make an impact for the glory of God. And people need to keep on getting saved. People keep, need to keep on growing spiritually. We keep on, we just keep, need to keep on growing. And so in order to do that, we have to not say, well, well look at this, we've already built three or 400 churches and we've got buildings and now we're, it's like the man saying, I've got everything I need and I'll just tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Don't be like that, just ask God, what's the next step? Don't ever look at yourself that I've come to the end of what I need to do because you're never going to come to that place. If you just keep on day by day walking and being obedient over and over and over again as a missionary and as a dad and as a husband. He had to lean in and do things that were scary and unknown. Um, and I think that those decisions, the daily decisions to do the next right thing is what brought him an extraordinary story. It's like his courage was the extraordinary piece to just continue to say yes and then the next thing yes. And to say dad didn't make mistakes, that he did. He made mistakes. To say that he didn't, um, you know, stumble or that he didn't get discouraged or all that is part of the ordinary. All of us get discouraged. But what's crazy is you get up and you say, okay, what's the next right thing? All the time. And you just continue on and you don't quit. But the biggest thing, even bigger than, than the story is what he's got to experience because God's met him. At the end of the day, like God, Jesus, Yahweh is where the joy is. I got to live most of my life right in the center of God's will for my life. There's not a better place to be. It's amazing. It's just amazing. I want to thank you very much for watching a video about the life of Randy and Phyllis Sturwell. You haven't seen Brother Randy in this video because he is currently in the hospital. Brother Randy is dealing with colon cancer and that colon cancer has been in several parts of his body and he has been fighting like crazy to stay alive, to continue to do the work. Never known a man with more heart for Jesus. Never known a man with more heart for the work of God. And I absolutely never known a man who loved Africa as much as Randy Sturwalt. Brother Randy, is a warrior. Brother Randy is a great man of God, but God uses regular people. You heard the testimonies as you watched the video. You heard about them being bus kids. You heard about where God brought them from, and you saw what God has done. And I have here with me a pair of Brother Randy's tennis shoes. He's walked all over Africa in these shoes, but I thought as we held these shoes, I can ask you, who would fill Randy Sturwalt's shoes? Brother Randy has seen God start dozens, actually hundreds of churches. And of those churches, somewhere up between 40 and 50,000 people attend church on a given Sunday. I know the man of God he is. Brother Randy asked me a long time ago to help him raise up workers for the mission field. Now, God buries his workers, but he never buries his work. And right now, you're listening and you've been watching this video, and God is burdened in your heart that if God could use Randy, if God could use Phyllis, God could use you. And we would love to see you surrender. Kenya needs workers. Yes, there are workers there, but there are millions of people without a preacher. All over Africa, 54 countries, there is a great need for somebody to preach the gospel to those people. We here at Vision Baptist Missions want to help you make a difference around the world. Brother Randy has been a missionary with the Bible Baptist Fellowship for years, uh, I think over 40 years in Kenya. Brother Randy's in the hospital. I pray God gets him out. I pray that God gets his health back. I pray that God allows him to go back to the field. But if he, even if he is allowed to go back to the field, Randy's an older man. He's 68, 69 years old. And that means he doesn't have a lot of time left. Would you pray about it? I asked Brother Randy about his shoes, and he said, they're just regular shoes. They're just regular shoes, and I'm just a regular guy. And that's the truth, because it's not about the man. It's about the God who sends the man. 
It's about the God who empowers the man. It's about the God who called a young bus kid and sent him to the mission field. I would be honored, Randy and Phyllis would be honored if you'd surrender. If you don't have the training you need, we give it to you at the, our Generation Training Center. It's our Bible college and our preparation. If you need a mission agency, we'd help you. If you want to go with any other group, we'd help you. All we want to do is see the gospel got into the world. Now you watch this video. You can't just walk away. You can't. You can't just walk away. You have to pray. You have to pray that God would send laborers to his harvest. You, got, you can't just walk away. You've got to give money look like you've never given before. You can't just walk away. Like nothing happened, you must pray about going. Change your default setting from stay to go. Say to God, I will go if you want me to. I'll be used if you want me to. So I end with this. Just use. Just use. And as much as I love Randy Sterwalt and think he's one of the greatest men I've ever known, he was just a man. But the gospel is in need of people. You can join in the sufferings of Jesus Christ by working alongside him. You can get in the shoes with Randy Sterwalt and carry the gospel. Your life could make a difference around the world. I am begging you, calling on you, and challenging you right now. Surrender and take the gospel to the world.